to start with today, we have a CABI Bioenergy 101 talk by Dr. Bruce Dean. Bruce Dean belongs to the CABI Conversion Group, where he works with Ming Chung Cheng, Pat Sillinger, and BJ Singh. He is a lead scientist in the Bioenergy Research Unit of the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research, a regional USDA lab located in Peoria, Illinois. He has worked on converting herbaceous biomass to biofuels and chemicals for 30 years. Today's talk will be a very short review of bioprocessing biomass at the four energy biocenters with an emphasis on pretreatment. His talk is titled, Introduction to Bioprocessing of Lignocellic Feedstocks. Thank you very much. So this is a literature review, and this shows the main steps for bioprocessing. We would mill the biomass, then we pretreat it to open up the cell wall structure. We use enzymes to convert the fibers into sugars, which we then ferment a bioproduct and then recover. We're very lucky at CABI to have the IBRL. We, are, we can test all the different unit operations at pilot scale. And as mentioned today, I will be emphasizing pretreatment. There are many different pretreatments out there. There are physical pretreatments such as milling, chemical pretreatments such as fluid acid, and physiochemical pretreatments such as steam explosion. This shows a schematic of the cell wall with the cellulose fibers, the hemicellulose, and the water hydrophobic lignin. The idea of pretreatment is simple. We want to deconstruct the cell wall in order to allow the enzymes access to the individual cellulose fibers in order to produce sugars. In the case of dilute acid, this, remi this rem um, involves removing the xylin and lignin. And here, as you can see in this classical study by Charlie Wyman, as we remove the xylin from the cell wall with dilute acid, the cellulose digestibility goes up in a linear rate. In fact, with hot water or dilute acid, we'd like to remove about 80% of the xylin. Lignin's a little more complicated. As we remove the lignin, the cellulose digestibility also goes up. However, sometimes we are unable to remove the lignin and in that case, we need to mitigate it. And as you can see, as we continue to pretreat, even though it's at 20% removed lignin, we still um, continue to increase the digestibility. However, I don't want you to think that we're making refined sugars. We're actually making dirty sugars. As this work from Shabalis' lab shows for dilute acid and liquid hot water corn stover, our hydrolysates are filled with other chemicals as well. These are often bioactive and inhibitory to both enzymes and microbes, which introduces additional challenges. Each of the bioenergy centers has a different bioprocessing strategy. At CABI, we're looking at hydrothermal processing for pretreatment and co-product recovery. GLBRC has traditionally looked at ammonia fiber expansion, but recently switched to GVL. CBI is looking at consolidated bioprocessing with co-milling, and JBEI is looking at ionic liquids. This shows the CABI um, pretreatment process. It's centered on our steam explosion reactor, where we're able to continuously feed in biomass at 50 kilograms per hour and 50% solids. We pretreat it at 180 to 190 degrees for 10 minutes before flash cooling it, and then we mill it in order to make it additionally digestible. The advantage of our approach is that we have high commercial readiness, we pretreated high solids, we do yield fermentable sugars, and we don't use a catalyst. The disadvantages are we're melting the lignin and it's relatively high capital. This shows Ming Xu's work where he's been able to take the high solids in a fabricated high solids hydrolyzer that we um, were able to get from our collaborators at um, Oregon State University. And with this special hydrolyzer, he was able to hydrolyze up to 50% solids using a fed batch strategy. And he was able to realize up to 20% sugars or 200 grams per liter. This is very high for lignocellulosic biomass conversion and allows us to look at fed batch fermentations. So what is the value add proposition of lipid cane to the IBL biomass processor? Well, pretreatment is required to extract the oils. So if we can um, 
charged to the lipid oil, the cost of our pretreatment, which is about 37.8% of our capital costs, as well as the feedstock cost, which will be greater than $60 per ton, then we have a really good chance of making fiber conversion economical. This shows the ammonia fiber expansion process developed by Bruce Dale. Basically, he takes his biomass, he treats it with 100% loading of ammonia, 60% loading of water at 140 degrees for 15, 15 minutes before he explosively exhausts the ammonia. You can see the effect here. We start with very nice, well-ordered cell walls, and afterwards we have very fuzzy cell walls that are also very digestible. This shows the complete mass balance for Aphex pretreated corn stover. And the reason I'm including this is just to let you know that it's a very mature pretreatment technology. And in this particular case, he was able to realize 79% of the cellulose as glucose. And furthermore, as you can see here, it's very fermentable and they were able to get 30 grams per liter of ethanol with no lag phase. And they've been able to also use AFEX for further um, efforts in order to look at a regional biomass depot with INL. The concept of this is that the farmer would bring their corn stover bale to this plant where it'd be AFEX pretreated, but instead of being converted to sugars, it would be converted to pellets, which could then be brought to the main biorefinery center by truck. The advantage of the AFEX process are that it can be scaled down and it has low cellulase loadings. The disadvantages are that it's high pressure, requires ammonia recovery, xylen hydrolysis can be problematic if you do not have good hemicellulases, and it only works for herbaceous biomass. Here you can see Bruce Dale with President Obama and my old new boss, the Secretary of Ag. So ionic liquids are a newer form of pretreatment. It really came on the forefront of pretreatments in 2002 when a University of Alabama researcher showed that certain um, ionic liquids could dissolve cellulose and then when you add water, the cellulose would recrystallize out. However, it'd be in cellulose two form. And as you can see here, cellulose two is much more digestible than cellulose one. However, ionic liquids have headwinds. First, they're often toxic against enzymes and microbes, so you need to wash the pretreated pulp very well. The other thing is they're very expensive, so you need to be really good at recycling them. JBEI has looked at getting around some of these disadvantages by developing a one-pot bioprocess using biocompatible ionic liquids. In this particular example, they used one kilogram of sorghum with a 10% solution of choline lysine, where they treated it at 140 degrees, followed by neutralization with HCl, and then they hydrolyzed it with enzymes and fermented it. And you can see here, it fermented very readily, and they were able to get up to 40 grams per liter of ethanol, which is commercially relevant. The advantage of their process is they were able to, through the one pot system, reduce capital and complexity. The um, choline lysinate will remove lignin from the cell wall matrix, but does not dissolve cellulose in this application, and it works well in woody biomass. Disadvantages are the catalyst costs, even though they're much more reduced from the original ionic liquids, and also you need to be very, very efficient at recovering the catalyst, which adds complexity to the process. So the fungal enzyme base case I've been talking about is just a very complicated operation because there's many unit operations and this adds capital. But let's say you could just grind your biomass and put it into the everything unit operation, which would pretreat it, hydrolyze it, and ferment it to ethanol, which you could then distill out. Well, this is Lee Lin's many decades dream, which he's termed consolidated bioprocessing. And it's based on the fact that there are cellulitic bacteria that will directly digest cellulose and biomass. And here you can see with Clostridium thermocellum that's able to hydrolyze switchgrass very well. And in fact, when he isolates the um, cellulitic enzymes from Clostridium thermocellum, it has higher civic activity than the normal fungal cellulases. And the reason for this is well known. In Clostridium thermocellum, the carbohydrate enzymes 
are laid out on a protein scaffolding called the cellulosome, which means they are superbly balanced. In the most current form of consolidated bioprocessing, Lee Lin imagines a co-treatment where basically he fills his bioreactor with steel um, balls, and then he adds his um, bacteria and his biomass. And while the bacteria are digesting and fermenting the biomass, the ball bearings are constantly impacting the biomass and opening out further surface area. This has a big effect. As you can see, when we have the co-treatment with the ball bearings, we get double the carbohydrate solubilization as when we don't have the ball bearings. And if you look at fermentation as measured by gas production, we get much higher gas production here, though we do have somewhat of a lag phase. The strengths of the CBP um, process is low capital, no external enzymes, and it can be appropriately scaled for lignocellulosic operations. It does have some weaknesses. Despite decades of work, it's still in early stages and further feasibility studies are needed. Also, the organisms are mixed acid producers and need to be engineered to selectively produce ethanol. And while there is a clostridium thermocell now that they have that can make 50 grams per liter of ethanol off refined sugars, this has been very challenging. Furthermore, it doesn't ferment xylose, so they've had to engineer an additional organism to convert xylose to ethanol. And they're still working out the details on the co-culture here. So I'd like to end with some final comments. If you look back over the 15 years of um, bioprocessing, really what stands out is the commercial improvement in cellulase formulations, which have led to new pretreatment options and commercially realistic sugar concentrations. And I think you can directly attribute this to strategic funding by DOE of the enzyme houses. Furthermore, there have been vast improvements in xylose fermenting microbes you know, by people like Dr. Jin, who are part of CABI. There is now greater emphasis on understanding the role of lignin in bioprocesses, and some groups even seek to extract uncondensed lignin as a value-added product, such as in a pulping operation, most notably with, for example, CELF and GVL. And there's interest, as you all know, moving beyond ethanol, including to chemicals and green or renewable jet fuels by chemical, microbial, and combination strategies, most notably right now, the commercial operation for catalytic upgrading of ethanol to jet fuel. And with that, I'll conclude and say thank you. So Bruce, this is Madhu. Um, thanks for that talk. I'm, I missed the early part of it. So, you, so um, but I was curious about, uh, you know, moving from ethanol to these, to jet fuel and drop-in fuels and things like that. Uh, is that something that uh, is being done simultaneously as we're trying to improve our ability to produce ethanol or is that, uh, you know, or does that technology depend upon how we are able to uh, solve the challenge of producing ethanol to begin with? There, there are several routes. Um, well, as I said, there is a commercial route by uh, um, Lanzatech and others to convert upgrade ethanol to um, jet fuel, but there are also direct routes. For example, we're working with yeast that make lipids that can be immediately converted to jet fuel in, in CABI and the conversion group. And then there's technologies that will take sugars, for example, and crack them with hydrogen and convert that to jet fuel. One, one of the issues that um, people are sort of curious about is, you know, the idea of whether we'll have green hydrogen too that we can integrate into the process. In particular, if you're thinking about drop-in fuels as an alternative to gasoline, is that still something that people are working on or is it mainly now looking at how we can produce more of the diesel alternatives? Um, while there's still interest in biodiesel, there, there's a lot of interest in um, converting it to a green diesel, like Nestle process, or also to jet fuel. And some of this is, um, I think, pushed by the in part by interest because of electrical vehicles to try to move the industry more to um, things that might not be as easy to um, run by batteries. And, and also, I should say, you know, working with the, um, for jet fuel, the airlines are real, in aviation industry really, really want renewable fuels. And, and they'll, um, they'll give you contracts. So, so I think they're also, there's market pull there.
just wondering, um, among this uh, different approach that you presented, so in which approach uh, present ligning in the cell wall sounds more problematic? I know some methods are very effective, so they, they don't really care about the uh, ligning or something. But. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of different approaches. Um, some of the newer ones have thought to use solvents or ways to maybe extract the lignin. Um, it's probably, you know, with ours, it is a pass-through and it's very commercially readily. So it's gotta be, you know, what can you do with the lignin? Can you really make it into a different product? Because once you start with the separations steps, it can get very expensive in terms of capital. Um, so, um, and there's ways to work around the lignin a little bit. You can add protein blockers and stuff to help increase the efficiency of the enzymes. Um, the AFEX does not remove the lignin and, and it still makes a very digestible material where it's not absorbing the lignin. That's the sort of a, I'm sorry, a little roundabout question. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, I think we're seeing sometimes a little bit of two ways. One way is let's do a simple pass through, get the capital costs down and, and we may not get as much value of the ligand. And the other way is maybe more of a um, expensive way based on predicated on maybe if we can get some value out of the ligand. So I think they're both worthwhile approaches. <laughs>